Okay, hi everybody. This is session three for um, the OELI cohort of 2022. Um, and we are focused on food injustices and solutions in Ohio. Um, my name is Maya. I'm a hydro tech for Miami Conservancy District in Dayton, Ohio. And a topic of interest for me is just how to uh, include more diverse communities in our care for the environment and um, getting more active in environmental policy and things like that. So whoever wants to go next, go ahead. I'll go ahead. <laughs> my name is uh, Jasmine Stewart. Um, I'm an entrepreneur. Um, I own a small business called I Thrive. Um, I love teaching the community about agriculture, growing food, gardening, things like that. I also teach youth gardening here for uh, Dayton Public Schools. Hi, my name is Christian. Um, I am a food access coordinator in Warren, Ohio. Um, I'm from Youngstown, but I work at Warren. Um, my interest is also to um, having a space for um, Black and Hispanic folk and anyone else of color in Ohio to learn more about environmental issues. And also, too, I wanted to introduce our um, person that we're interviewing today, Ms. Sophia Buggs. Um, she will share more about who she is and the amazing work that she has been doing in Youngstown as well. Well, thank you so much. Happy everything, everybody. My name is Sophia Buggs. I'm the owner and operator of Lady Bugs Farm, located on the south side of Youngstown, Ohio. I wear many hats in my world. I want to say the umbrella to Ladybug's Farm is definitely education, outreach, um, and I also grow small batches of produce for some chefs and some community stores. And um, I'm also the Mahoney Food Access Coordinator, and that particular how works with Healthy Community Partnership, which is a bigger organization um, striving towards making sure that the Valley is healthy. And I'm also the Environmental and Food Justice Director to Intentional Development Group. Well, thank you. Thank you for being here. I do have a question that is not on our list. Um, how often, or I guess, how did you get into what you're doing now? Because I feel like we don't often see people who look like you, who look like us, doing the things that you're doing. So what, what, what motivated you to get going in this area? Well, one, I will say that I'm born and raised in Youngstown, Ohio. And my mother uh, took us to Central Florida because there were jobs. So this is when I was a child. And so um, going to Florida or living in Central Florida, uh, um, definitely a culture shock different from Youngstown, Ohio. So that's probably why when people say, are you sure you're from here? It's because I've had a life of living in Central Florida, which is uh, a little bit more diverse and different from here in the Valley, but it's one of the greatest blessings to have ever happened to me. But I've always known that I would return back to home. But I want to say um, because I had an opportunity to review some of the questions it makes sense I've always heard what what some deem as the voice inside of me and so that voice has always connected me to nature and as a child I want to say just going outside and playing all the time and playing in Mill Creek Park and my grandmother helped asking me to help her garden with her and being in the kitchen with my grandmother and I was the kind of person that kind of always hung out with the elders knowing what I know now and kind of answering this question and I've answered it a thousand times in my career careers um I think that it, it was my life has always led me to this so um why I think we don't see more of us is because along the maturation of living, things happen to people. And those things, some of those things did happen to me and I was able to move through it. And some people, some of those things happened to others and they weren't able to get past or move through it. So I wanna say that we weren't exposed to the 4-H programming 
that was happening as a youth. Um, it's a joke that uh, a deceased cousin of mine, rest in power, uh, cousin Harriet, uh, would say uh, when we when Facebook showed up in my life because I'm I'm that age where there was not a social media or Facebook, and someone asked the question, "How did you know that you would?" be where you are and I said because I kept getting kicked off the cheerleading team for picking flowers all the time and my cousin would laugh because we were a community and she was the the cheerleading team leader and she was the child local child care in the neighborhood so uh, cheerleading practice was a place where I could go be safe get a snack have an activity and then come back home with someone I knew but because I kept picking flowers I wasn't following the directions <laughs> and I would literally get in trouble and my mother was like if you don't stop picking those <laughs> flowers and do what you're supposed to do and I just couldn't help it and I didn't know how to not pick the flowers and that's a real thing it is a real thing Michelle Soto shout out to Michelle Soto from Cutting Roots Farm and Butler PA uh, she just asked me to come teach her wild cherries class on how is it that I'm so intuitive with the plants and uh, I can do it now but before then I didn't know how to explain why I had this uh, alignment with these plants but I want to say that now that I know more of who I am and how I kind of uh, uh, dove deeper into my own personal life life story and and, and the work that I'm doing, I want to definitely say that I have always just been very introverted. And some of the traumas that I've experienced have forced me into a space that is so real that it sometimes is bigger than the reality that we have. And that gift that I have, I want to say, was expanded because I share uh, um, collaborative trauma with other people. And a lot of those things we kept secret. But I was fortunate enough being a home that said, even though they still didn't listen, tell people. So the only place that I had to go that could save me other than my mother and my blood, my family was this secret place called my imagination. And that place has kept me. That place makes possibility. And it's so loud, it's so big and it's so real. And I'm never alone, ever alone. No one said to me that could potentially be an ancestral space. No one said to me that there were plants and trees or other living beings that could communicate with me. So because that wasn't an active part of our waking life, I just knew how to turn it on and never turn it off. And so I think that just my steps have prepared me to be to this point. I wasn't forced to be here. But I want to say I chose this space because giving birth to a daughter put me in the hot seat of now what that's like to be mother, to be grandmother, to be sister, to be elder, to another human. And then I can see why whatever those things did that happened to me happens on their watch because they too were distracted. They too were turning this big old wheel on the world. And the societal world didn't allow them to fall into their wholeness. So because of their sacrifices and all of what they had to go through and all of the stuff that I went through, they kept telling me to stay alive and keep hoping in spite of we were having some challenges and trauma. So I, as I gotten older and I didn't have that team of people around me, I was forced to lean into bringing that world into my reality because I had a daughter. And that loop was coming back. The traumas could have potentially been in my daughter's life. I could have chosen those fragmented ways of living. But somehow I kept hearing them say, we need you to do it better. And my doing it better was doing what I loved. But I didn't know how to get back to nature. It was always a part of me. I've always, when Whole Foods opened, I thought this was a miracle, you know? When I learned to make calendula oil on my own, such confidence. And it really felt like church to me. And mm. although I wasn't going to church, I remembered that feeling. So again, they gave me these tools. 
and the tools and my experiences I made archetypes I made into living breathing beings that I could communicate with no matter what they looked like they were always there so those are the ones that have kind of been protecting me which is my imaginary friends but those imaginary friends eventually turned up into plants and when I finally heard the call which was hey we're looking for someone to do this urban farming program it was like it was the I can't explain it and I at the time was not big about online but I was online I seen it come through the feed from North Side Farmers Market but goodness grows Greg Bowman was looking for a farm apprentice and the word he used was that they were desperately looking and I thought that is like a career of a lifetime. He's not desperately looking. I mean, isn't that a rare thing where there's not enough resources? So something said, just call. And I was like, why? Because it's probably I'll feel that. I was the only per- I was the only person that made that call. So <laughs> wow. here I am. <laughs> And you know what? If I could intervene, because as you were talking, I'm sitting here scrambling down those like I have right? to ask about this. First of all, <laughs> you when you said that you grew up in a time where there wasn't no social media, I totally dig that. But here is where life comes full circle. I don't know Sophia personally, but I know her from social media. And like maybe even a year ago, maybe even two years ago, I remember seeing a video of you, Sophia, online and I don't want to say I was obsessed, but I'm like, how are you not? I am literally falling in love right now. Right, like, I'm I, like, I, and, and I think in the video, I think you were like, may have been dancing in a garden. It was something, but I'm like, the way she looks, the way she sounds, what she's doing it, how she's doing it. Like I was the just, energy. I was like, I, I don't know what it was, but I wanted to say that to also shed light on, yeah, social media can be trash sometimes, but it really gives us like the power to like really impact and oh, reach sure. people that we don't even know exist. And yeah. also how sometimes your name could be in that room long before. Like, I didn't know I was going to meet you in this program, you know, but here we are. But secondly, when you said when you made that calendula oil, first of all, I love calendula. But when you said you made that oil and it felt like church, would you agree that that is because creating is of God, like to be creating or to be a creation is of God. Would you agree with sure. that? Sure. And we, we have a culture of people who claim to be God, you know, and I get that point, um, what they're trying to say. But I, we have to be careful when we take on those titles because it's more than just the rewards of wearing the title of God, which right. is like you said, to be the creator. And I want to say just your wholeness makes it God, Mm -hmm. meaning everything, the good, the bad, the indifferent, because, um, and and just to keep tying it into more nature perspective, that is how you learn to be God, is to be in it, to be in it, to blanket yourself with it, to to create the, it's it's, I don't like rigidity but you have to fall in love like, like Islam um, to the dean of religion. You have to recite and you have to recreate that blueprint that's just right there, that blue, black, green you. And we all have that. Don't let the, don't let the, the, the wor- where we are now give you vision as to what you look like as it relates to your skin color. That's a distraction and it is illusion and it ain't real. You are more kin to these green multi-flora plants and these trees and mushrooms. And that's what you look like. That's what we all look like. And we can never be who we are without the contrast reflection of it all. So when I say it like church, I was like church, that was just like a blink of, the fellowship hall, you know? And if you wanted to have the whole church day all the time, it's to be in service with nature. Nature wants to serve. And it just serves from a different kind of perspective. And I want to say that's what has held me because I've every year tried to quit farming. Every year, sorry, this is falling. Every year, 
every year I said to myself, oh, I'm not doing this. It's too difficult. You know, this, the, the people are requiring too much of me. And um, the plants are easy. I've even made comments. I like people better than plants. But the plants remind me that they're here to serve and they frolically want to serve. And I too need to always be in service. And as the groups like special needs groups that I work with, when I get frustrated with how the service is being to other organizations, other people who need our support and when they're being mistreated and I say, I'm not gonna do it anymore. They look back at me and they say, well, if not you, then who? Who else has the capacity of teaching the, the ones who aren't good and the ones who are good? If I go away, then who will be left to stand up um, to champion that nature and that wholeness is such, such a great aspect of who we are. Um, so that's, I want to say how I have been connected to farming. It, it's not because it wasn't because I'll say this, I got connected because of health reasons, my daughter's allergies, and we, I had a kind of budget cause I taught at Full Sail University where I could just go and shop there. But when that was taken, when I lost two of my jobs, which is a lot lactation consultant for the state of Florida and working as an assistant, a uh, lab assistant at Full Sail University teaching. When I lost those two jobs, I had to return back. Well, I returned back to Youngstown. I made that choice because I felt like it was an overarching opportunity of a lifetime. And things for me happened in threes. I lost my grandmother, then I lost two major jobs and I've been unemployed in Florida and that's, it was too much. So I returned back home into my ancestral home and I would rekindle my grandmother's zucchini bread and I tried to make it and it did not taste like hers and I, my mother told me well you know what the missing ingredient is I was like what you should tell me if I made it she said you gotta grow it so because I've always loved my grandmother and she's always been a guiding voice I had her in a physical but she's bigger in the ancestral realm she had that audible voice, even though I had her part of me physically, and it just was the same voice that kept even when she transitioned. And so I was really, really needing my grandmother. So to do that, here I am living in her house and trying to rekindle a garden that she um, graveled in. Oh, that's where I had to learn about container gardening because I had to garden. Oh, no. <laughs> right. I come back home to a house that I thought was going to be like when I was a child, but it was a much older rundown home and a much more dilapidated neighborhood. And because she was sick, she could not maintain the bushes, the rose bushes, and then the backyard garden. So she graveled it in. And I thought, how do you get this far? But my life in farming has been exactly like that. Like I got this big dream. I know what I'm supposed to do. I get there and it's like, rocks is this real and because I'm so optimistic and because again I'm always listening to the voice I google how do you grow rocks and container gardening sprung up it was like this light bulb and then I start growing in kiddie pools and then after kiddie pools some boxes and raised beds and then I wanted to look over the fence and I thought what do you oh, have growing right get- now so right now currently I'm cultivating um wood betony some uh, basil, some sunflowers. I know people would want to kill me about the morning glories, but I absolutely <laughs> adore them. I love my morning glory, so I get it. I get it. People are like, <laughs> um, you, you know, that's a weed, right? I'm like, I'm yes, <laughs> right, 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 right. Um, um, and for most of the part, like the northeast plant prairie species, and my pawpaws are blooming. Uh, I have pawpaws this year for the first time. I love that. That's amazing. Um, yeah. I, there was one question I was going to ask, and now my brain has shut down. Um, you've pretty <laughs> much answered a lot of the questions that we had written down for you. So mm-hmm. you have nailed that. I appreciate <laughs> it. Um, and then I guess if you could leave us with like what your favorite recipe is, like what's something that you and en- you really enjoy making off of the stuff that you have grown um in the beginning it was like 
foodie foods, sticky things like pickled okras, big into fermentation at first. I had, I did kombucha for years and would give away. <laughs> Speaking of kombucha, I got to bring Matt into this. That's how I got connected to Trouble County Neighborhood Partnership. Long before that was a TMT, there was just Matt. <laughs> Matt the gardener, who was from the north side, but they're living in Warren. And it was a core set of people. And I'll say this too. Um, I think a lot of them can remember this. A lot of our leaders now in the Valley that are leading space um, organizations that on um, green spaces involved, many of us began in the garden with, we all having degrees, not knowing to do, what to do with our work. And we were just gardening and we met each other. Fast forward 10, 13 years later, we're now executive directors. We are now farmers. We are now agriculture leaders. And I probably can name a lot of them right now. So that is, a, this is a good pathway into a green future. This possibility is here. Um, agriculture is so expansive. It involves pretty much everything. And I think the biggest disservice that we do is trying to say what it needs to look like or what it's supposed to look like. Farming is more than just production, just like climate change is more than just weather patterns. Um, we live in a society where people are so distracted that they aren't aware of the vastness of their own self-care and their own healing, which is in their front yards. I can look in your front yard and tell you what your health issues are. I saw some of those questions um, and I like the fact that you were asking about the spiritual aspect of it. And I wanted to touch on that because. Not Girl, I was so, are... I was so going to ask you before we got off here. I well, you know what? I'm going to let you ask it because it's a, the way you ask it will help develop my answer better. And I feel like this is such a, I don't even know if I'm asking this question right because mm -hmm. it's such a complex thing. But in, a sim in simple terms, can you explain the spir spiritual aspect of farming? When people yeah. talk about even tending to their garden or meeting God out in the garden or just anything yeah. like that, like, can you explain even just for you what that means? Sure. And I, I definitely would reference it with the oneness of God or the personal relationship you have, like God, it is like that. Because um, if we can all equate to maybe prayer, meditation, or something a little bit more rigorous like yoga, meditation, or making salat. Uh, I'll use salat as an example. To wake up at five o'clock in the morning is such a sacrifice. You know, you don't just like, okay, I'm going to get up and you know, it's a, it's a, it's, it's a struggle, even when you, you practiced it over and over something in you just wants to sleep longer, but it's some sacrifice, some personal sacrifice that has to be made for the greater good for yourself though, for yourself. And that's what we don't get is that simple walk outside. That simple sit on porch is for you, not for anybody else. It is the quickest, easiest way to your wholeness. The, message that, the messages that you get from the mycelium grid is phenomenal. If I showed you how many times I keep cutting this wild grape from my fire bush, the wild grapes look like arms reaching towards me because I'm on my porch so often. Mm -hmm. They follow me, just like that big sunflower mammoth head that looks like it's this giant thing looking upon you as the sun turns. There's so much movement in gardening and farming, but I can't tell it to you. It's a secret. You got to get out there and experience it. And when you do, it's like one of those, you know what I'm talking about? That touch and agree. So that's what makes it sacred is just that experience and the feeling that's kind of not with words. But once you get out there, it kind of triggers where you are already with your ancestry. So you might hear bagpipes. Yeah. You, know, you know, you might hear bells. You might hear humming. You know, you might just hear the wind. You might hear flutes. You might hear running water that you don't see that there's running water. But we all have synchronistic messages unique to your own bloodline 
that will connect you to source, but you got to go out there and get it yourself. I can't tell it to you. So that's how I can explain it. I knew when I did the healing garden, people just wasn't trying to garden because they think it's very laborious and it is. But if I could just get them out there, I, that's all I had to do. Get them out there with some water and a snack, a word of the day, and then we went to garden. When I tell you, Jill's thinking, the people that would come to the healing garden that I would run twice a week on a Tuesday and Thursday between like, I think it was like a, a 10 to one or something like that, a snack, a word of the day, a gardening session. And then we close with uh, a discussion. And the and you could come as you are, so you don't have to garden every time. The healing, the young girl had to tell us that the house that she was staying in, which was supposed to be a safe house because she was being molested, wasn't a safe house. It was another house where they were molesting her. You know, um, or a man comes to the garden because his anger is so great that he want to hurt somebody in his house. Literally in the garden and around, we had there was gunshot fires two blocks over, and I'm grabbing mothers to not run because your response immediately is to go help. And I'm trying to say to them, our place is in the garden. If we're not in the garden, no one would be here. Being in the garden is much more powerful right now than being over there. But I had to connect them with this thing that I'm trusting that when they leave me, when there's no more healing garden, that they'll find a healing garden within their own lives. And for some people, it is literally physically gardening. And for many people, it's just your everyday life. That gave me you chills. Know? That gave yeah. me chills. There yeah. was there was three things I just wrote down. And I'm just going to spit them out. And Sophia, if okay. you want to just talk about time. any of them, just go ahead. Uh, first thing someone had once told me I was on this quest to figure out like what does it mean to be spiritual what does it mean to like spirit what does this mean and somebody once said they said to be of spirit means to be of sound and movement and to figure everything else out on my own so that's something where you were talking about that that kind of made me think about that when you mentioned getting up early historically you know people would get up you know four or five six o'clock in the morning and somebody had once told me like yeah those are ancestor hours like if you really want to get some clarity you really want that meditation to hit for real you really want your wishes to come true you really want you know mm -hmm. to be heard all these things you need to get up before four and six so even you just said like getting up at five it's a doozy but you know what i'm saying if i want to be well if i want to be clear-minded these are the things i have to do and i kind of I hate how that's only attached to like farmers. Like, oh, only farmers get up right. and crack a with the roosters. Like, no, everybody should probably be getting right. up around this time. But right. also, and lastly, uh, just even one great thing I learned about being in the garden or even just on land period is life after death. And what I mean by that is sometimes we go through life and like, I know I feel like I've died before. Like I've been in situations like, bro, there's no way I can come back. There's no way mm -hmm. I can love again. There's no way I can't hope again. There's no way. But in the garden, you might think this plant is dead. It might have one small little bitty leaf. And that one little bitty leaf lets you know this baby is not dead. So that even what you're saying about the girls coming to you for gardening, I feel the same kind of way. Like sometimes people come to gardening for a fellowship and yes. healing in a way. Yes. And, and I, I always yes. just come back to like, it's yes. not over. Like it's, it's not and over. They don't have the language to say that. They don't yeah. have the language when they show up to say, I'm coming. Because I need healing. I'm coming because I'm thirsty. I'm coming because I need to be covered. I'm coming because I need to be well. So I want to add the part of one of my other gifts is a psychic clairvoyant. It's one of those things they call me. I was a professional, not was, I still am. But I professionally read at the Hidden Path for eight years here in the Valley. The uh, Hidden Path was located in Struthers. And uh like that space was, um, wow, it was a place for people who did not have religion or a spiritual space. So pagans, witches, Druids, root workers, conjure folk, African tradition, spirituality, all of that was kind of roped up in this place, space where you could come and buy some items. I taught some of the classes. We primarily followed the both seasons and the cosmic flow. So we did solstices, gatherings, plant medicine talks. My, the day I read like twice a week 
in the day where you just, I'd have walk-ins and then clients. All of that to say that to have that kind of profession, there's no certification in that. People just would say, could you help me? And I would say something and people would be like, oh God, yes. And so somebody was like, you should really do this. My community told me that I had a gift for them. And so I responded and then I connected it to a cost and then a, a space found that I, I had the gift and I was reading. So I'm saying when I wanted to increase the service that I had, my gardening farming was the thing that said to me that as long as you continue to champion me, I will increase your abilities. And so the more I grew, the much more spiritual I was and the less cards I used. I, I immediately moved from Oracle cards to, I felt the need to create my own system. So I created a bone and ruin system. <laughs> How I did it, I don't know. I didn't do it with a book, but it just, I did it. And then from then I started creating curriculum around it. So I could never do one without the other. There are some of us that has got a bunch of talents and some just a few, but those are my strongest gifts is the ability to serve, but I can't serve without nature. It's impossible. And if I think I'm going to shortchange nature, nature has a very interesting way of shortchanging me, sort of like a breastfeeding mother. You're nursing your baby and you're not eating well. All of the great nutrients is going to go directly to the baby while you lose your hair and your teeth and your vitality because that's how the system designed. People still gonna keep getting served, but my own avatar and my own well-being is will be declining. So get your butt up at five o'clock in the morning and get out here and be grateful and thankful for this alignment. Especially during these times. If you keep acting like you don't remember that contract I had with you about being outdoors, then I'm gonna have to treat you like the rest of the folk that's out here, right? And that's clearly the difference. It ain't because you more whiter or living in a much more affluent community. You got power lines and you're just like I do. You get sick just like I do. You struggling like I am too. You're insecure like I am too. And someone's negative to you as well. But how I manage the life that's been given to me in a checks and balance is nature. And when I feel like I can't give nature back to what nature gives to me consistently, unconditionally, that's where my spiritual practice comes into play because I'm raised better than that. My grandmother didn't give me a uh, hoodoo, but she gave it to me. She taught me to reverence things that were unseen and look at me, you know? The unseen are some of the greatest forces and I have a full respect for what that looks like. So when people say I'm a force to be reckoned with in the room, I don't even see myself. That is a real thing. It's assumed Come that I'm this calm, <laughs> this confident, this this together, this I every day I'm struggling about something. It's just how I'm handling it. If you watch my TED talk, it was like one of the craziest times of my life. And these people wanted me to do this TED talk and memorize a speech. And even in the midst of doing a TED talk, it was so many challenges, which are the challenges of the world. I don't like bosses. I don't like people telling me what to do. I'm in full alignment and I'm clear about this. And if I'm not able to do this freestyle from a sovereign perspective, it's just not gonna work out. And it was only then one coach who was like, we gotta let her do this because she's not gonna memorize. Why, as a public speaking teacher, I would never tell somebody to memorize something, but they do it because TED Talk or TED is in a box that has to do it a certain way for the bigger TED to even share it on YouTube or your stuff might not even be shared. And so because it was a bigger collaboration, you know, they just wanted me to fall in place, but I knew I wasn't gonna memorize it and I did memorize it, but I also showed them that when you reach out for people like me, these cosmic entities who are very clear about who they are, you should leave space for them to just be themselves. And when you do that, you get one of the greatest speeches ever. But walking out on that stage, hearing my boots click on that, that stage, I didn't know what was going to happen. But after I did that ancestral opening with that plant, it was, I can't explain it, just clarity. 
just came over. Just like when I did this OSU presentation at their Earth Day event, there was a whole riot before the event. Literally bullhorn, shouting. They ushered the president off the stage of the institution. People kept um, saying, are you okay? We're gonna bring security over here for you. And I said to myself, these, I, I couldn't just have a presentation where it was like Queen Goddess is coming to the stage, but I was so calm. I was so cool. I was so aligned that all of those things were almost like a game that I just moved out of the way <laughs> to do what I had to do. I had a chance to get on stage to talk to the activists, to let them know I saw them that I felt them, that I acknowledged their pain and I shared it with them, that I wanted to share some solutions so we don't have to hurt this much. And to also remind them that my, my kindred people, even though I believe I'm more indigenous to America, I don't believe I have a slave narrative. That's just my own personal thing. But I am kin to folk who were brought over here on boats, that many of us over 400 years have been trying to even regain our indigenous identity so I stood in solidarity with them in their pain. But there are ways for us to be louder without hurting other people or crossing our boundaries. And they just left the stage, you know? And I was able to still deliver a presentation. And my presentation um, was even, was received much more because they realized how important um, nature is to people to keep people cool. And that's why the statistics show that wherever there are gardens and green spaces, there's less violence. And that is not just in the physical green, but that's also, you, also your mimicking, emoting, and being tree-like, plant-like in the midst of adversary, you know? Uh, shout out to Hoodoo. Shout out to Hoodoo. <laughs> um, <laughs> my last question would be, what is your favorite plant to use uh, medicinally? Did you do that? They, oh, I had to. I <laughs> like a staple. What's a staple that you have on hand all the time? So I'm being triggered to just say probably yarrow. Yarrow, because when I first started farming, it blanketed my farm I remember looking at the grass because that's the first thing they asked you to do what kind of soil type you got and I remember thinking this just doesn't look like grass though my grass don't look like grass and I remember telling that to the OSU extension agent and they came and looked at my grass and it was like well I'm sure you're right this doesn't look like grass and if you know what the carrot tops look like of yarrow or just that carrot family look these little fairy bows of, and I remember I was applying for a small grant to get my first part of infrastructure. And I was so worried, you know, you're worried about this grant. And I remember going out there not wanting to cry and be strong. And I cried saying, you know, I just don't have enough funds and I want to do this so desperately. And I just, if I could please like grant this to me. And the next day, my entire farm space was blanketed with white flowers. The entire space, it was like a day of snow in summer. And it was mind boggling, captivating. It's the way you would see white clover now blanketing the grass. It was yarrow everywhere. And I looked up the, flat, the plant, what it was. And that actually is the plant that my great grandmother used to have our cousins pick and she put in paper bags into the cabinets to dry because she would make tea of it. Yeah, and so I had never seen yarrow before. I saw it in temperature and I seen it in dry plant matter, but I'd never seen it real and alive and wild. And so I would say shout out the yarrow because it's good medicine to stop bleeding. It's good medicine as a heal all. Um, it's good as a tincture. Um, it's also really good just to have as a good plant medicine ally to keep available um, um, for you. 
And it is also really a good wild medicinal plant to keep you aligned, I think more so to the mycelium. Um, it's a very um, cross-cultured plant. I can't remember what its energetic properties are, but the color is white. And so when I think of white, I think of purity, I think of clarity, I think of Obatala, chief of the white cloth. And I think of all of the, 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 the morning doves or the doves, Sophia, my name, and its totem is a dove. Wisdom is the owl, but I still think of the dove of whiteness. So it's a gentle, powerful medicine that I absolutely love. <clears throat> I know you said that you were in, you're pretty introverted at the beginning of this, but I really think that like every little black girl, little black boy, any any person of color really needs to like come and spend a week with you, like, <laughs> and just really. Because I think these kinds of things that you're speaking about, like I was lucky I grew up in a daycare in Cleveland, my mom owned. So I grew up um, around people who were, you know, housing insecure or, you know, they would come in and they didn't have clean clothes. Um, yeah. And as a way to like take take these kids out on uh, field trips, we would go to the Cleveland Metro Parks because they they always had free activities. So I grew up in the parks and that led me to you know getting um a, a scholarship to a school down here that was connected to a park and then now I'm a hydro tech so I work outside every day so it's just like little <clears throat> little things like being introduced to the outside early on can change your life mm -hmm. so I, I don't know how mm -hmm. to create you in multiple capacities so everyone can can experience the way you talk about the environment, the way you talk about the energy. I think mm -hmm. it, like, you know, instead of saying your daily mantras in the, in the mirror, like I just need to listen to you speak about um, how you carry yourself to remind myself to be, to be grounded. And I like, I just want to say thank you so much for being on here. Thank you. It's going it's gonna, to it's gonna change people when they get to the chance to listen to this. So I'm excited. I definitely appreciate you. I appreciate your reflection. I appreciate your transparency. And I definitely uh, appreciate your, your honesty. And I would say most children and folk with special needs and elderly people kind of speak that same language. Getting them outside. And, and I will say, I, I, never, I never seen a woman like me in growing up in nature. And I can say that the books that I've been gravitated towards or the images that I gravitated towards are what my house looks like now, which I thought was an older middle-aged white woman in a cottage with a fireplace with herbs around her garden. But I saw this image and I assumed because this is what we do in the world, we think that the only white people or lighter people or Europeans have access to this good life. Um, I was the woman inside these images that I see because when I pull up to my little old house and I see all these plants around it in the pathway and where the apple trees are and where the morning dove often comes and when um, the red cartners are, that's, I've been seeing myself the whole time. Agriculture has allowed me to see myself in the stories that I've been creating, which is very childlike and very introverted imagery kind of thing. And when children or young people see me, it I often repeat myself because they don't um, believe that I'm a farmer because I don't look like what farmer looks like to them. And But it immediately says to them, I wanna do that. So when I was at East High doing some gardening classes, I remember those students like, there is no way that you have a plum tree in Sophia. There is no way you pick apples from a tree that's on your property. Miss Sophia, you really doing that? When they finally <laughs> saw that I was really doing that, immediately, I remember two of the young men wanted to do a pickle pepper business. Real. We did a refrigerator pickle and they were blown away. And what I had to do to keep them interested, because when 
the plants finally bloom in their garden, schools out. So when we planted, what I would do is do a cooking demo that related to what it would look like. So with very little tools, I did a lot of fermented things and we did refrigerator pickles. When it come back to let them taste the pickles, they were like, well, we're not gonna really eat those pickles. It was just a project. We're not eating those. And I was like, okay, who's the leader in the class? You're, you're missing out. You know, you're It'll be out. the best pickled you know, thing you'll ever have. I'll try it. They're like, I'll try the pickle, I'll try the pickle. Ate the pickle and he was like, you can see he wanted to cry. He said, I did this. He said, this cucumber and this vinegar made a pickle like the grocery store. Can I call my mom? Like the light bulb went off. And he said the language in return that I needed to, him to say in contrast in real time, not in a piece of paper or a memorized document. Yeah. Yeah. If that's and I say that too, if all I got was that, I did my part in farming. You know, think, so you gotta be true to it for sure too. Um, because a lot of us, Christian understands this too. A lot of people in the world with food access or food or nutrition is in a title, but none of them really go outside. When I go to OSU's events talk about food 65 people in the room with big salaries have food attached to them and they don't even eat fruits and vegetables themselves that is our broken food system is heavy on all kind of areas and that's what i'm hoping to do is to ignite the leaders not the ones who don't know but the leaders who are already out there doing the work to encourage them fall into their vulnerability take your ass outside and do it for real not for your job because this is the future. This is the future. This technology has always been magnanimous and it is growing bigger and bigger. And nature, if you ain't with her, then you won't be because that's the only thing that exists right now. Your healthy immune system is directly tied to how much you go outside, period, period. That's the greatest, freest vaccine ever go outside but I tell you what it's sort of like when I did a womb wellness meditation when I would ask women to call their abusers out of their wombs I would have women close their legs and say I can't see it's not so easy for everybody people will say I'm going out I'm gonna go out I've been there I suffer from depression I gotta get out there and get my get to the porch, do some porch stuff. And I just can't do it. Get around the back and still can't. And the universe made my farm in a way that it sits in my backyard, but there is a sacred path you have to go through to get there. So crossing the sacred path coats me with all the things that I should be worried about and more concerned about and not these distractions. And that's the heavy part which is me not doing enough to support my wholeness. That's the only reason you are here. Not that job, not to be that for somebody else, but you, and boy, I tell you, people will love and respect you more. You'll make more money and have less inflammation when you do all of you, all of you. They gonna not like you even if you don't. They not gonna like you even if you do. Do what you wanna do. And the way to do it is to do it in this kind of a capacity. To so take I tell your people, ass outside. <laughs> take your ass outside. Eat a, and I that's one of the other things I tell people is eat a leaf a day and um eat a wild plant a day. Just that's like go outside a, and grab one. Yeah, I mean, like now we've got black raspberry. I love go that. eat a black raspberry leaf. Black raspberry is much more, I'm not going, there's no plant much more. They all have their capacity, but they're selling it as a superfood in the grocery store and people are cutting it down to mow their lawns. Why? Black raspberry is so powerful and medicinal. The leaves of black raspberry leaf is so astringent, cooling, healing, and iron rich nutrient goodness. That one leaf is probably the whole box of dried raspberry leaves on the shelf 
drop it in some water, put it in your pocket, kiss it. I don't know. I was I was shook when I seen uh somebody selling uh dandelions. <laughs> I was really shook at that. I did not I I, I don't want to say what store I thought it was because I don't want to be wrong, but the store I believe it was being sold at was a very high end store, and I was really like, <laughs> not this same dandelion we cut. Every, like y'all so irritated that grows in your lawn, not the same. And one. you literally spray like killing gone. pesticides on to get rid yes. of, yeah, yes, and to and and you know, and to not push back against most of those people they don't know, and they're caught in the loop, and everybody does it to save and protect their own wholeness. They're just unaware. Because that's my other challenge is I'm granted food access person and doing green face stuff, but we don't all agree on what green is. I don't spray Roundup on my plants. I don't do weed management. I eat my weeds. You know, I, I, I often remind them that we treat people the way we treated the plants and I just can't do it. You're not going to make me not be mean to the Japanese knotweed or the multiflora rose because it's evasive. It's evasive because you brought her over here to be showy and then when she wasn't cute enough for you, you just discarded her like you did other humans. And I, you're not going to get me to do that. Nope. So, and there are studies now um, where people are showing if you eat them and work with them, they're not as, as evasive. Because they have a mission and a job just like you do. That multi-floral rose is saying, I can't leave this cover uncovered. The earth has to be covered. She can't be bare if she's buried as sickness. So mm. multi-floral rose, I get it. I cover it. I got you, mother. And I'm going to put some flowers on it. And I'm going to protect it. And I'm going to heal it. And here we go. Oh, look at you. Look at you out here. You know, we do this. We have to be very careful what that looks like. Production, you know, farm, farm producers is where the bigger challenge is. But I think even still in, if we get our consumers taste buds geared towards more bitters, more me me medicines, I think we could do, uh, we could introduce Northeast uh, plant prairie species more to people's lives um, than what they, what they're consuming, you know, uh, like the pawpaw, like the pawpaw. I talked to an arborist the other day who couldn't wait to tell me that they were an arborist. I asked them what their favorite tree was. They didn't know. How you are you an arborist and you don't know you don't have a tree? They asked me what my favorite tree was. I said, really, it, it, it's catalpa, but right now my love, my heart strong is pawpaw. And I got pawpaw. Mine's a sycamore or a ginkgo. So okay. yeah, I got one. Okay, ginkgo. You know what I love about ginkgo? Tell me. Ginkgo was one. Ginkgo was one of those trees that they planted in. So I'm old school. So some of my language does sound really old school. And the devil strip. I don't know what it's really called in the medium uh, in front of the house. The oh, the the, the, the so tree I, We called it. What well, we called it the devil strip. Why I don't know, but that's what it's called. And they planted. Most of these planted trees in them, but one of the trees that they wanted to plant was the ginkgo. But they didn't realize that the ginkgo would change its sex. Right? And I love that about the ginkgo. And so they planted these male trees because they didn't like the female trees because the female trees makes a mess. It's fruits and it's dropping. And I love going in the old neighborhood how all the ginkgos are now female now, dropping all of its fruit all over the street. I love Yes. <laughs> I love it. it. <laughs> I love it. So, um, yeah, I was asking the artist that and I was telling him that, oh, I've got this pawpaw tree and it's about to make the bloom. He was like, oh, it'll never grow mature. And those trees don't never make fruit. And I was like, you're in the state of Ohio. Did you know what Ohio state fruit was? Why would that be the state fruit if it never would grow in right. to maturity and fruition? Right. You know, we are really lacking in knowledge when it comes to agriculture as Ohio. Ohio better get it together because we are the heartland. We have the ability We of know how to grow some corn though. That's for sure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Feed. We know how to grow feed. But that too yeah. is a lost art. And um, FYI, I will say that the universe for whatever reason just probably didn't 
bring us together because we weren't aligned there, but there are a lot of black farmers in Ohio. I'm fortunate to have crossed paths um, with some, some other black and indigenous um, growers. There's a, a wonderful movement that is happening and I love that it's happening slowly. If it happens too quickly, then I think we'll be just another group that did try to do a thing. But for it to be this type of deeply intentional way of doing it, it's gonna have to come from, I think this deep rooted kind of uh, space, not from a production space that we're not gonna win there. We're not gonna spring up and all of a sudden grow on rows and rows that it burns you out. I'm not that kind of farmer. I did it for the first three, four years. I'm standing at markets trying to educate folk on why my Cherokee heirloom tomato was $1.25 a piece over Walmart's prices. That is deflating when your own people don't understand that this is not slave food. From seed to table, I do this. Wow, wow. Okay. And because the lack of information was there, I didn't like that food lot vibe at a market either. So I just kind of fell back from being at a farmer's market. And if I do go, I'll probably only sell herbs because that's when I'm the most alive. Where you can ask me a thousand questions, I'm never burnt out. With herbs, I don't have to work too hard. And I've got so many stories to tell about them and I eat them more. So I I think I'm more of a medicine woman than a farmer. Um, I'm an old time grower. I'm an old time healer. I'm um, on the path of, of returning back to my greatest um, achievements right now. And this is a wonderful yet interesting time to be alive in that I can bear witness with my eyes and ears that we are really, the, the planet is really going to a shift and I'm like a midwife helping her deliver, you know, the people of the planet to back to her. And the greatest way of doing it is my own life work. Don't get it, don't get it twisted. Nobody else way, my way. That's the best way. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Well, as we, I don't want, I don't know how, cause this is in our Zoom account. So I want to make sure we don't get cut off yeah. um, and get an opportunity to thank you for your time and for, for everything you have said. It like, I, I cannot wait to rewatch this recording, yes, <laughs> and, you yes. know, and learn something that I missed during yeah. this. Like it, it, you were amazing. you you are amazing. Thank you. So. Thank you. Thank um, you. We are all, we are all amazing. Her. Thank you so much just for your right. time, just everything as well. Thank you so much. Right. And so if, there are any, if there's any way that um, mm-hmm. people can reach out to you and ask you questions, will you sure. give us that information? Um, sure for our, you know, young people who are looking for people to look up to, you know, just, yeah. Anyway, so, so my, you can post that on, e- go mm-hmm. ahead, sorry. My, my email address is um, Lady, L-A-D-Y, my last name, Bugs, B-U-G-G-S, Farm, F as in Frank, A-R-M, at gmail.com. And I'm also on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook as Lady Bugs Farm and as Sophia L. Bugs. Amazing. Thank you so much. Um, we're going to go ahead and um, end the recording. Did Christian, did Christian have any questions? I know I work with I Christian. Know. I know. I asked him many times. She <laughs> said, no, you just right. do your thing. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, you answered all the questions that you yeah. Mind, but yeah, I knew that Maya and Jasmine, like, I know that this is like their first time meeting you, and I, I just wanted them to just experience you. You knew our you minds know. were going to be blown. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, yes, <laughs> yes. So, uh, I hope well, thank that. you I, for I introducing us you know and bringing her on. To I do, yeah. do want to add, um, because uh, I was thinking, just trying to be mindful of everybody's question. Uh, Christian and I work in it work with uh, as food access coordinators and I we work with working with stores that I'm calling community stores corner stores and I do an urban wellness market that is a way for us to uniquely get fresh produce to a food-based business and offer a wraparound support to what we're saying is important which is having more whole foods and fresh produce available a lot of the stores don't have the financial infrastructure because Produce is not like a t-shirt that has a, you know, a shelf, it has a shelf life. And so if it's not sold, then it goes wasted. And most people aren't used to 
shopping from produce from a convenient way. So some convenience stores have small amounts of produce for people to do some grab and go. And some convenience stores are wanting to have more of a shopping capacity where people are carrying where they're carrying four to different five mixed kind of fruits and vegetables. But the urban wellness market that I've had to curate to give to them is showing them that you can even use not just the inside of your store, but the land that it's on. That's my secret into the work that I do because I want to include the business owner, the community, and the land. We forget that the land is also a part of this work. And so if you could create small markets outside of your store, it will absolutely show that you are a community store because you're sharing shared land with people who are deemed either hungry, poverty, or without. And food is definitely a way to get nutrients, but we eat better when you eat it in a whole perspective where there is healthy food options, whether they're packaged, whether they're body care products, whether there's oils, whether there's baskets, but other things besides just food also make up why we would want to eat better foods. Wellness, a better life will have you choose that. And our markets will allow that to be available to people who want to be well. You can shop for whole foods, you can shop for wellness care products, and definitely shop with people who have wellness-based, community-based businesses. Thank you for your time. I appreciate each and every one of you. And I love you all. And I'm hoping that we have an opportunity to align again. Yes. Um, If you ever find yourself in Dayton, please, please let me house you and feed you and... (laughs) Well, I'll see you for OFA next year then because I'm in Dayton every year at the Ohio Ecological Food and Farm Conference. Perfect. That's amazing. Yeah, thank you so 